Hey, Wrench Row Tires, it's Adam Schrader here with another episode, joined as usual by the Exactly Master, the founder and CEO of Rent to Retirement. And we are pleased to be joined today by Mike Madsen. He is the Vice President of Acquisitions and Economic at Real Source Residential. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, good to be with you guys from here in the Rocky Mountains and Salt Lake City and excited to uh, have this conversation and learn uh, more about what you guys are doing and what opportunities you're seeing and and get to know uh, your investors and what they're trying to do and, and work with you guys. Yeah. So we're going to start, you know, we're going to dive into some other stuff later, but we always like to find out how people got started in real estate. So tell us a little bit about kind of how, what your first real estate deal was and what made you fall in love with it enough that you are continuing to work in the uh, real estate space. Yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, I knew I wanted to be a real estate investor at a very young age. I uh, bought my first investment property at the age of 19 and were renting rooms and remodeling. And I really got started because uh, my grandfather, who I looked up to very much, told me that a hey, 75% of millionaires have made their money in real estate. And so that really stood out to me and knowing that I had to figure out a way to make money and take care of my family. I thought real estate is a good pathway and uh, I really just dove into being passionate about how things are done and how people are making money in real estate. I then was fortunate enough to meet uh, Nate Hanks and Real Source. I'd known Nate uh, most of my life and seen how well he had done. And when he told me about his business model, which was kind of looking at the whole country and saying, hey, if we knew where to go and which markets to invest in, like how much better could we do? So I've uh, been here with Real Source for almost 20 years, been really passionate about all the investment strategy and how we pick our markets and how we go about identifying opportunities. And it's been a, a great 20 years. Uh, the people here that I work with uh, do a great job, very risk management focused and, and risk sensitive uh, philosophy and business model, which I think really matters today and really stands out and is why we've had so much success over the last few decades. Now, has the way that you vetted markets changed over those 20 years or has it remained constant? And what are the the big things that y'all look for whenever you are looking for a market? Yeah, it's always kind of molded and changed. The roots of the company have actually been investing outside of your own market. And if you go back 20 or 30 years ago, um, a lot of individual investors weren't always comfortable investing outside of somewhere where they could drive to. And uh, obviously that's that's changed quite a bit, but the roots of our company has always been live where you want and invest where it makes sense. And we started with providing real estate research to private individual investors who were looking for the next best market to go to. The market they were in, they kind of knew the cycle was in an expansion phase and there was too much supply, but they wanted to keep growing and keep moving. So really, the company grew organically of just a group of real estate investors that were like-minded, knew that by working together, they could get more knowledge and information and learn from each other and, and go to different markets and succeed. And so we really grew from there. We have a lot of uh, clients that have been with us for over 20 years. And obviously, if you're investing in real estate, you know, 20 or 30 years ago and then doing it right and focused on cash flow, you're probably doing pretty well right now. So we've we've grown from there and we've expanded along the way. Eventually, uh, instead of taking our clients to specific markets and identifying multifamily assets for them to buy, they said, hey, you guys are good at this. We like the economies of scale. Why don't you guys go find the properties? And we'll all invest together. And we started doing that in the early 2000s, doing some of the tenant and common structures. And we've really, you know, grown and evolved from there, gotten into really our value add strategy, um, which today I think is key to have a value add strategy and multifamily to to get the returns that people want. Yeah, that, that's great, Mike. Thank you for sharing that. I, that's very interesting. I did not know that about you, that you started when you were 19. Sounds like you're... You've been a hustler for for many years, you know, renting out rooms, and and I love that. Um, and yeah. I really like the the fact that you um, your guys' company started as a more of like a research based, right? You're you're providing data for real estate investors, and that kind of shows me that you're 
it's all about the research, right? And providing and knowing how to pull data and looking at that on the front end is, is really like the first essential step to set yourself up for success. And I really love that you said, uh, I think you guys' motto is, you know, invest where you want and, or live where you want and invest where it makes sense. Because that's the same thing, you know, that, that's the same mantra that we adhere to here. Because, I mean, if anyone listens to my story, I started investing when I was stationed in North Dakota in the Air Force. And there, uh, North Dakota is not like the great ideal market to invest. It was okay for cash flow, but really the pivotal moment that allowed us to really expand, my wife and I expand our portfolio and make a big impact, impactful difference on our lives is being open-minded to investing in other markets. Because more than likely, and this, this is probably true for everyone listening, regardless of where you live, there's probably a good chance that there's another market out there that has better returns and a more optimistic outlook uh, than than your local market. It's just statistically, the I'm like, markets are dynamic and they're always changing. So once you change your mindset about being open-minded to investing in different parts of the country, it not only allows you to have a more diversified portfolio, but really allows you to focus on markets that adhere to your goals better and, and likely will allow you to excel. Um, we want to dive into just the idea of, of investing in larger multifamily deals. Many of our investors are focusing on building a strong foundation of real estate and single family and small multifamily, likely diversified across a few different markets. I think that's a fantastic way to build a very predictable real estate portfolio with a good foundation. That's the same way Adam started, myself, it sounds like you as well. Uh, but we have many people that are interested in, okay, what's the next level? Once you have a really good portfolio of single family and possibly small multifamily, you know, what's the next step? There's a lot of people that are interested in expanding into multifamily investments and participating in larger type of deals, which is really the same pathway that your your company has grown and excelled. Um, and I want to talk about what what Real Source does and what type of projects you guys focus on. And the the big picture, let's let's actually start with like why multifamily? Why should someone consider, especially in the value add space? Uh, you know, if someone's being a successful investor in single family, why, why should someone consider participating in larger deals? Can you give us a few bullet points of like why you guys went to the the scale of multifamily? Yeah, I mean, I, I believe in multifamily and have most of my investment in multifamily for one simple reason is, is everybody always needs a place to live. And that kind of sounds like kind of an old cliche thing that, that people said, but once COVID hit, we all realized that uh, retail and office people didn't need that like they did multifamily. So, you know, number one, it feels like being very risk sensitive and wanting to protect our nest egg as well as grow it, that there's a certain safety in that factor. But then if you look at, well, why multifamily over single family? I think a lot of people get their start in single family. Most of our clients um, started with single family or smaller apartments. But really, to me, the biggest benefit you get with multifamily is economies of scale. Um, we're able to go and renovate kitchens for a third of the cost that probably somebody's going to renovate a single family kitchen on their own. Then when it comes to operational efficiencies, just overall, when you're buying two or 300 unit apartment buildings and you're looking at your expense ratio, uh, those economies of scale ultimately bring stronger cash flow if you're doing it right. So uh, the ability to have them all together and be passive as an investor, a lot of our investors, you know, started hands on. And as they've kind of gone further down the road, they're like, hey, I just want to collect my monthly check and get on the quarterly calls and ask the questions and follow along the reports. But I want to truly be passive. And so multifamily allows us to, to work together. Most of us can't afford to go and buy a 300 unit apartment building on our own. But if we find some like-minded partners and we work together and we have the right business plan and the right exit strategy, ultimately uh, it's going to lead to better cash flow, which is hard to find these days and higher returns. If you're really working hard and pinpointing where to go and you look at the whole country and say, well, wonder if I always knew where to go or wonder if I had a model or a programmatic way of identifying where each market is in the local cycle and I'm constantly moving from one property to the next, I'm fixing it up, I'm repositioning it, I'm exiting, and then I'm going in 1031 and into the next opportunity. That's where we've found success and multifamilies so far been the best avenue for us to do that. Yeah. Economies of scale, I like just to break that down. And I, I agree with you. I mean, one of the most attractive things on the multifamily side is 
and just to further define like economies of scale and, and look at the economics of that, it's like, and, and just for everyone's knowledge, when you're evaluating, you know, when you're buying a single family house, you're not really looking at a cap rate. Yes, you're looking at your return, often your cash on cash return. But when you're getting a, a bank loan on it, uh, you know, it's based on, you know, not the operation of the property. It's based on the property and their, you know, market value, appraisals, things like this. And same thing when you're buying and selling assets, like the the value of the house is based on comparables and, and the income of the property is, is somewhat irrelevant. Um, that means if you're doing a value add, the really on the single family, you have to improve like the, the square footage of the house. You have to improve the house itself, but you have somewhat of a ceiling. With multifamily, once you get past the, really those, those four units, and especially on the larger deals like you guys are working on, um, you can make really small tweaks across the board. These could be efficiencies in management. This could be a reduction in expenses, slight increase in, in income for the units. But across the board, I mean, if you have an apartment complex that's 200 units and you do a slight increase in rents of $10, 20 you know, dollars per month, that adds tremendous value because there's, to your point, economies of scale and multiple doors, which not only increases the cash flow on the house, but it increases the value of the house because now, you know, when you're evaluating multifamily deals, it's all about the net net income on it, right? And that relative to what the cap rate is in that market. And so you can make these small tweaks and often sometimes big tweaks, which have big ultimate results, but that's kind of the the benefit of the value add and using economies of scale. Would you, would you agree with that, Mike? And, and maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I'm sure a lot of the people working with you live in a market like I do to where if you're going to go buy a single family house and you're going to put 30% down, you're not cash flow and you're negative cash flow. So you need to look outside your own market and say, well, where are the fundamentals a little different to where I can get cash flow? And there's no doubt that multifamily has always been valued. It's all, you know, a math formula for for NOI and cash flow, which as you point out, as you increase your NOI, increases your value, but it does give you those economies of scale. Um, one simple example is if, if somebody goes and gets their, their own internet and they want high speed internet, it's what, 75 bucks a month, sometimes more as to where, and if a whole apartment unit goes out and gets Wi-Fi for the community, it could be somewhere like 20 to 25. And then that savings can be split with the the residents themselves, but also the, you know, the owner of the property can can charge a little bit more in their rent and and pass that along to both the resident and to the performance of the property. So um, no doubt that uh, the economies of scale is a big factor. You know, we underwrite hundreds of deals a year. We see probably 500 deals a year and we're constantly combing through and saying, okay, well, what is the value today? Which often comes down to, to the math equation, looking backwards and the performance of the property, particularly the last two years, but really kind of the magic of what we do is not identifying, well, what's this going to trade out? What's the value today? It's looking at the property and saying, okay, well, where is their upside? Is, is there mismanagement? Do they not have a website? Uh, are they not raising rents? And are their kitchens look like 1990 and people aren't renting because they want a newer kitchen? So a lot of what we do, we use a comprehensive underwriting model that comes through and looks and says, okay, well, how many of the leases are 10 or 20% under market rate and paying less than the neighbors down the hall? And so we account for all those things and ultimately we're looking for that opportunity and saying, okay, where can we take this in a few years if we renovate the kitchens, if we reposition it through better management, better asset management, run our efficiencies of uh, economies of scale of us having thousands of units across the country and we're really focused on which properties we can increase our NOI by, and earn higher rents by making it a better place to live and renovating the interiors and sometimes the clubhouse and grounds. So are there anything that you see that's like an automatic disqualifier whenever you're you're looking at these kind of deals? Like is, if someone's looking at a, a multifamily deal and they see this, they should really consider running away. Like what what would you consider to be an automatic disqualifier? Well, one is you have to kind of look and check and see, okay, well, are they running this artificially low? Are there expenses? Is there something going on that's making 
their cap rate a little bit inflated. Um, so we do that by using a lot of, of our uh, third-party resources that gives us aggregated data so we can go and say, okay, well, what are the other 1980s, 200 to 400 units? What are their expenses? They don't tell us what it is for a specific property, but as soon as you get five or six, you can kind of compare that. So you really want to make sure that their expenses are accurate. Um, one example would be, you know, a lot of these cities and states, if you bought 15 years ago, your property taxes are 50% of what they should be. So you can't look at that and say, well, the day I buy it, my NOI and cap rate is going to be different. So we have to do what's called a tax adjusted cap rate and make sure that we're accounting for all those things. But the other key barriers for of entry for us is we don't like to buy 70s product. Um, a lot of that was the building code that kind of changed between the 70s and 80s. There's a lot looser policies in the 70s. And what that means is there's a lot of more deferred maintenance issues and things like that. So it's really important to get in there and understand what the deferred maintenance is. Um, if you need a new roof because the roof is leaking, that's not going to help you improve your revenue and NOI because the resident already expects the roof not to leak. And so we're really focused on 80s and newer and ideally really targeting more 90s and newer and avoiding that what we call just heavy deferred maintenance and then the other key one would be just kind of the basis uh, we've really stuck to the fundamental of buying below replacement costs and sometimes that gets a little tempting to chase the offense and chase the growth and go into these markets that you're reading about everywhere else and say well it's you know 400 a unit but look at the rent and as everything is cyclical. It really has paid off for us throughout kind of the macro cycle to just buy below replacement cost. And the other key thing that I would watch out there buying multifamily is just the affordability index. Um, a lot of these markets, just the average rents in the area versus the average income are just hitting a level that's showing a red flag. And if you know we don't get a soft landing and things slow down, that's going to be a problem. So I would definitely try to keep an affordability ratio of under 30, ideally under 25. Yeah. I mean, we're all familiar that there's a, an affordability crisis in the U.S. right now. And that's that's really important when you're, I think, on a macro level looking at markets. Um, you stated in the beginning, you know, you, you guys adhere to motto of live where you want and invest where it makes sense. So I want to hear about how you identify markets, markets you're currently in, markets you're looking at. And- where does it where does it make sense to invest right now? Yeah, so the history of our company, as I mentioned, is is the research, and eventually we created a proprietary econometric model that looks at 160 different MSAs, takes 35 different metrics. Some of those are what I call offensive metrics, and some of those are what I call defensive metrics. And so what that does is it creates a score based on those 35 metrics for each market. And so we can let the, the economics and the model go and kick out the ranking of one through 60. And the other thing we do to be proactive is we adapt those metrics and what we call the weighting of each metric uh, year to year. Uh, forecasted rent growth is going to be much more highly weighted right now than, say, trailing 12 occupancy. And Eight years ago, when we had a huge housing shortage and there was very little new supply issues in most metros, that was dialed down. But as we went forward and more starts started getting elevated in 2022, we really dialed that up. So we really kind of consider what we do kind of a science and an art. And the science of it is trusting the data, looking at the model and saying, okay, let's let this boil this down to the top 25 or 30 markets. And then from there, we say, well, where are we getting traction? Where is there risk? Where is there other barriers of entry that eliminate some markets? And we, we also measure things on not just an MSA level, but a state level too, because we really learned that a lot of policy is set on a state level. And that's really paid off for us and really been uh, a, a big,
big thing to helping us stay in the, not just the right city, but the right states as migration has turned up and a lot of policy has kind of been favorable and unfavorable to real estate investors. And so each year we, we look at our model, we meet with our economics team and we say, okay, where in this top 25 markets should we be focused? Where do we get the best traction? There's certain things that will eliminate certain cities. There's a few of the 160 that we'll track, but if the population's under 400,000, we'll avoid that because we've learned that if you know a big employer leaves or goes or some little bit of new supply comes in, it's just too sensitive to that. So there are some eliminating factors. Then there are other years to where we might look at our top 10 and say, well, you know, everybody else is playing offense right now, and we know the metrics that they're using, and they're focused on just job growth, population growth. They're already looking there. And so there's certain competitive years we have to look at that list and say, well, what are the undervalued markets on this list? Which which ones are trending up? Which one went from number 40 to number 25 to number seven? Or which one's been at two or three and is dropping down to 22? So we use that kind of art part of the process to say, okay, these are the 10 to 15 markets that we're going to go focus on. We want to get economies of scale. We want to buy more than one asset in that market. It, operational wise is much better. Um, and, and so we take that very, very serious and we consider it kind of uh, one of our kind of secret sauces to what we do, because as we've talked about before, if you go outside your own market in your own backyard, like you guys have been doing, and you look at the whole map and you say, well, where's the best place to buy? And if you can ace that and you can do that well, ultimately you're, you're going to earn higher returns and have more so, success. And I agree with you. And it sounds like your guys' data is, is dialed in. I mean, give us like two or three specific markets where you're currently focusing that you're very optimistic about. Yeah. Uh, Cincinnati, Ohio is where we have recently bought a couple large acquisitions. We got in there kind of before the Midwest kind of became the hot headline news. Most people if you're in multifamily know that the Midwest is where rents are still growing. There's not oversupply. There's some strong economies. Um, so we really like uh, what's going on in Cincinnati, Ohio. We think it's a little bit undervalued. The rents are very affordable and there's very little new supply and we like to buy more than one asset in a certain market. Um, we've also done very well in some of the major metros in North Carolina. Um, North Carolina consistently just ranks very well on states to do business, people moving there for more affordable places to live. And so it comes down to the kind of those state metrics. There are a few just states that seem to be just always in our in our uh, top target market list. Um, but a, f a few of the others that we're looking at, we really like uh, Nashville, but more for B class than A class because of the new supply. And we're also focused on um, Charlotte, North Carolina, in, in North Carolina. And I don't want to say everywhere we're going, but um, there's some markets that we're, we're very, very excited about. And we kind of feel like right now is the time for to be, it's like a markers market pickers market, meaning that there's so many markets to where rents are flat and rents will be flat. And there's other markets to where rents are declining. And there's other markets that are surprising because they're just steadily moving along and, and rents are growing. And so we just think right now, when you look back at the last 10 years, when like, 90% of the markets were going up and it was just a matter of who's what, where are rents and NOIs growing more than others. It's very different than right now to where it's like, if you don't, if you're not a sharp shooter and picking the right market, you're going to have very different results. And Mike, so let's talk about, and, and I agree with you. Um, here's the thing we've had, um, we've had a lot of people reach out to us to try to come on our show for syndications and other type of you know, sponsorships for, um, you know, promoting or, or partnering on, on multifamily type of stuff. And we've turned all of them down. Um, and, and there's no shortage of people out there, you know, that jumped into the syndication game. 
I think a lot of our audience is potentially interested in, I mean, most of them are interested in passive ways to invest. We obviously offer a solution for them to single family and small multi to, to own 100% of the asset. But we have a lot of people that are very interested to participate in larger multifamily deals, possibly being more passive, right? Where, where syndications are truly more passive than any type of ownership of real estate. And there's pros and cons with that. Um, but we we decided to bring you guys on because I was very impressed with your track record and and your approach to investing. I obviously like the assets that you were looking at. Um, and I think that our, our audience would very much value um, a recommendation for a reputable syndicator that's been around for a long time because we're also aware right now that there's a little bit of blood in the streets. We're seeing a lot of, a lot of syndicators and funds that are having, you know, that are struggling right now. This could be due to, you know, debt conversions and rate changes or just an operational thing, market changes. It's a really kind of a challenging time. We see a lot of funds and syndications that have had capital calls that have stopped distributions or not had any distributions for years um, that have tried to convert, you know, investments to equity. And it's just like, you know, that none of them, a lot of them are not, not performing like people expect. But when we looked at your guys' deals, um, you seem to be weathering the storm and performing exceptionally well right now. So um, that's why we decided to bring you on as an actual recommendation endorsement for people that are truly interested in syndications, um, because that's an, important to us, not just to bring anybody on. As, as we kind of conclude the, the interview, talk a little bit just about, and you mentioned things about real source, but I mean, talk a little bit more like why and how are you guys different from anyone else in the multifamily space? And feel free to share some details about, you know, specific examples with deals if you'd like, but why, why should people be interested to invest and trust real source? Yeah. I mean, I, I think picking the sponsor for, for those out there that work with different sponsors, have worked with different sponsors is, is really a big deal. I think picking the sponsor with the track record that understands how to ride through the different cycles and be a prudent risk manager, which is really what we've seen the last few years. We've had a lot of people that bought way too much in 21 and 22 way too much variable rates. We have been a law a, a proponent for fixed rates for a long, long time. And the further you go in that business cycle, the more important it is to have the right debt structure. And ultimately, when you're picking a sponsor, you're picking somebody that's going to be proactive to not just earn you their higher return, but protect your investment. So the people here at Real Source, most of us have been working together for 10 or 15 or 20 years. We all pull in the same direction. We all listen to each other from different departments and things like that. And so we try really hard to earn repeat business. The roots of our company are hoping that private individual investors are looking for cash flow and looking to invest with multifamily. And we're there to pick up the phone and talk to you and answer your questions. I think I think right now is a great time to get into multifamily. I think overall there's been a little bit of a, a down cycle. And in my opinion, in not every market, but most markets have bottomed. I think the industry has bottomed. I think that the cap rate situation is very favorable. And so uh, we have some exciting opportunities that we are have available to real source and rent to retirement clients that we're happy to share more information about. Um, it's a good time to be sourcing distressed and off-market opportunities. Uh, we have one deal right now that we're buying um, very close to one of our most successful assets that Real Source and Affiliates purchased a while ago that really we were the right fit because we could operate with economies of scale the previous owner bought it at the right time in 2020, being that the price has gone up, but he bought on a variable rate loan and it put him in a very distressed situation. He was not able to put the capital into the property that he should. He was not able to go with proper management. And so that's, you know, left opportunity for us. So uh, we're excited to go out and find kind of some distressed assets that are good assets and good locations that meet our buying criteria, but we're able to um, get with some, some upside because of that distress. Yeah. The most important thing I heard you say is protect your investment. So many times people get distracted by shiny object syndrome with higher than 
you know, higher than usual returns, right? You guys still offer an attractive IRR and, and preferred return on investments. But, you know, I think too many people get distracted, like, ah, that two or three more percent with this kind of unvetted sponsor seems more attractive. And that's gambling, right? Because you could, and we've seen this in some scenarios, possibly lose a large portion or all of your money uh, with the wrong deal and the wrong sponsor. And for the first time since we've been in business, you know, I've been very hesitant to bring on syndicators and, and sponsors uh, to, to talk about their business. Your guys' track record is impeccable. And, you know, this is this is an actual endorsement and recommendation for anyone that's interested in syndications. I think Real Source is the team to go to um, based on everything that I've seen. And you're the only company that I'm aware of that is not having turmoil right now. And with everything else going on, you're dialed in. I love I love the approach. So Adam, tell people where they can find out about yeah. more about Real Source and Mike's team. Realsourceresidential.com slash RTR. The one question I know we're going to get asked is, do you have to be an accredited investor to work with y'all or can are y'all open to investors of uh, all sizes? Yeah, we've, we've always worked with accredited investors. I think there's some openness to that in the future. But for right now, we do business with the accredited investors. We have other clients who sign up and get our newsletters and insights and reports on our target markets that maybe are, are not accredited investors or do like to invest on their own. So um, people can go to our website and, and sign up for those target market reports and insights and newsletters, whether you're accredited or not. Um, but we, we do have some good opportunities that we've saved some availability for um, that people can can see the the executive summary and see what the deal is all about and and why we're excited about it. But we very much appreciate um, your endorsement. And we also, you know, did a lot of research and homework on rent or retirement. And we really liked what we saw, really reminded us of our company and a lot of the ways we've done business and a lot of working with the, the same people. So we're hope that we can um, provide people with information, knowledge, and deals that they want to see and answer people's questions and they like what they found with, with real source. Yeah. So if you're accredited or not, at least you can learn about multifamily because they're putting out a lot of market data and a lot of information. So we encourage anyone that's interested in multifamily to, to reach out to Mike's team and, you know, continue your education. So Adam, sign us off here. Yep. So again, the link is realsourceresidential.com slash RTR. You can see it on the screen. Um, really appreciate the time you're still with us. Again, Mike is the Vice President of Acquisitions and Economics at Real Source Residential. To everyone else, don't forget to check us out at renttoretirement.com. You can you know, schedule a time to talk with us. Uh, we can see our inventory, all of those things right there at renttoretirement.com. And as always, if you have any questions you want us, we can either ask Mike or we can, uh, you can ask us directly. We can answer on a future podcast. Email them to podcasts at renttoretirement.com. That's podcasts at renttoretirement.com. Really appreciate the time you spent educating yourselves today. We'll talk to you on the next episode. Thanks for watching the Rent to Retirement YouTube channel. Check out some of our other videos, like this one, or this one here.